Uh, hello, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Ann Lamaster, and tonight we are talking about Chapter 21, uh, which is Water, Electrolyte, and Acid-Base Balance. Water, uh, pretty straightforward. Electrolyte, these are ions such as sodium, chloride, magnesium, potassium. And then, of course, acid bases are acids give off uh, hydrogen ions and bases give off hydroxide ions or accept hydrogen ions. <clears throat> so again for balance we're going with equilibrium or homeostasis if you will. And uh, what you want to happen is that you want for both water and metabolites you want equal amounts to enter and equal amounts to leave. Again balance. Um, and there are mechanisms in place for both. And this is to ensure uh, stability in the body at all times. Also, another important thing to keep in mind is that water and electrolyte balance are interdependent. Uh, if you remember from the kidneys, uh, water, let me see, here, water follows salts. So again, water and electrolytes are closely associated. <clears throat> Excuse me. So how are these body fluids distributed? Uh, not uniformly, so that means um, that different parts of your body have different fluids. Um, and water and electrolytes will move from compartment to compartment. So let's, in the next slide, we'll explore these compartments here. And you can see that here. So your body has, whoops, let's go back. I meant to erase my drawing. There we go. Okay. You have 40 liters of water in your body. That's about 22 liters, you know, good size display. Two-thirds of that is intracellular, meaning inside the cell. One-third of that is extracellular fluid, so fluid around the cells. And on average, females are 52% water, whereas males are about 63% water. Now let's break this down a little bit more. <clears throat> uh, what does extracellular fluid include? It includes interstitial fluids. The interstitial fluids are fluids found in tissues, uh, blood plasma. These are fluids found uh, in the vessels, cardiovascular vessels and lymph, uh, fluid found in the lymphatic vessels. Uh, it's important to remember, let me highlight here, that all three of these are pretty much the same fluids. Uh, it just depends on their location. Uh, transcellular fluids, these are fluids separated by epithelial layers. These include the cerebral spinal fluid of the uh, central nervous system, uh, particularly around the brain and spinal cord. Uh, aqueous and vitreous humors, those are found in the eyes. And synovial fluids, uh, those are found in the uh, joints, among other places. All right, um, now body fluids also have solutes in them, and uh, extracellular fluids, fluids outside the cells, have high concentrations of sodium and calcium and bicarbonate ions. Um, sodium, uh, if you remember uh, the nervous system, you needed high extracellular amounts of sodium. Um, also, uh, it's had support for calcium to be extracellular. And bicarbonate ions, that's the main way our blood transports uh, carbon, di carbon dioxide. Again, that is extracellular. Uh, whereas intracellular fluids have a high level of potassium and uh, phosphate, sulfate ions, and also magnesium. Now, how does fluid move uh, throughout the compartment? 
Well, that boils down to two uh, pressures. One, the hydrostatic pressure. Uh, this is blood pressure, so this is generated by heartbeat. And this, flu this pressure wants to push fluids out of vessels, okay, out of capillaries. Osmotic pressure, this is pressure within the capillaries, so the colloid proteins, the proteins too big to leave. Uh, osmotic pressure wants to pull fluids into capillaries. So again, these two pressures oppose one another and dictate uh, which way uh, fluids will move. Again, <clears throat> uh, focusing on water, you want water to in intake to equal the amount of water you excel or expel. And of course, you have a lot of mechanisms in place for that. Um, on average, you take about two and a half liters of fluid in per day, so about one big, I don't know, Diet Coke bottle. Um, and of that 250 liters of fluid, 60% comes from drinking, 30% comes from moist foods, and about 10% is a byproduct of oxidative metabolism. Uh, if you remember way back from Chapter 4, um, <clears throat> uh, when we make ATP, uh, the last acceptor, is a oxygen, uh, last acceptor of the electrons is oxygen, and that forms water. Uh, water outputs, again you want to get rid of about uh, two and a half liters of water. Uh, urine is the primary way we lose water. Uh, feces is 60% sweat from skin. Um, also we have evaporation. That's also called insensible perspiration. And evaporation occurs both on the skin and in the lungs during breathing. And it accounts for about 28% of our water output loss. Now, electrolyte balance is also regulated by the same mechanisms. So electrolyte intake is regulated by foods, fluids, and metabolic reactions. And electrolyte output, the three main mechanisms are perspiration, feces, and urine. And again, with electrolytes, you want to take in as much as you put out. So again, you want to maintain balance. Um, again, the electrolytes you want are sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, chloride, among others. Um, also, hydrogen ions. This is going to be essential for maintaining pH. Um, again, your ions are maintained from food and from water, beverages, if you drink a lot of sports drinks, for example. Um, and then, of course, uh, you obtain your electrolytes, well, of course, by eating and drinking. Uh, and responding to hunger and thirst. And uh, you can have uh, cravings. Some people do have salt cravings, and that can say you might have an electrolyte deficiency. Not all the time, but it can. Um, again, with electrolytes, as we said, uh, the greatest loss, uh, fluids from sweating, uh, kidneys, also feces, among other things. I cannot find my cursor. Here we go. So uh, on warmer days or when you do more strenuous exercise, of course you're going to lose more electrolytes. Now again, the reason why we have been, let me see. I keep losing my cursor. Sorry about that. Uh, we're focusing on sodium, uh, potassium, and calcium. 
Uh, these are needed for not only nerve impulse conduction, so our nervous system, but also our muscle fibers, and they help maintain cell permeability. And again, sodium is primarily found in extracellular fluids. Um, now, uh, potassium and sodium uh, usually go in opposite directions. So if you have a high amount of uh, potassium ions, um, you'll secrete aldosterone. Aldosterone will cause uh, the reabsorption of sodium ions and the secretion of potassium ions. So your sodium ions are conserved, but potassium ions are excreted. Calcium uh, is regulated by parathyroid hormones. Uh, and parathyroid hormones can either increase the absorption of calcium ions uh, from the intestines, uh, can increase the rate of osteoclasts, or can increase the uh, renal tubules. Um, now, um, phosphates um, are added. Uh, let me see here. <laughs> All right. Um, phosphate and calcium levels. When phosphates go one way, uh, calcium levels go the other. So when you conserve calcium, you will increase the excretion of phosphates. Um, acid and base balance. Again, acids and base uh, are regulated by primarily hydrogen uh, ion concentrations in body fluids. Um, and again, you want to keep your pH in check uh, because uh, any change in hydrogen ions can alter not only uh, enzyme uh, metabolic reactions, but it can also modify hormones and other reactions. Um, where do we get hydrogen ions? Uh, from our diet. Um, the aerobic respiration of glucose can, make, uh, can lead to carbonic acid. And the anaerobic respiration of, cellula of glucose can cause lactic acid buildup. Oxidation of fatty acids uh, can cause uh, an, etos, an increase in acetic ketone bodies. Uh, oxidation of sulfur-containing amino acids increases sulfuric acid. And um, hydrolysis of phosphoproteins and nucleic acids lead to an increase of phosphoric acid. And these all lead to an increase in the internal uh, of hydrogen ions, thus lowering the pH of your internal environment. So strong acids will release more hydrogen ions. Weak acids when they break down in water, they release fewer hydrogen ions. Uh, strong bases uh, ionize more completely and release more hydroxide ions, whereas weak bases ionize less completely and release less hydrogen ions. Now, uh, why you want to focus on weak acids and bases is because weak acids and bases can serve as buffers. And a buffer is anything that can resist changes in pH. And buffers are important because, again, uh, we want to maintain homeostasis and keep our, uh, the pH of our internal environment stable. 
Now, uh, most metabolic reactions produce more acids than bases. Um, and again, uh, so to keep our acid-base balance, you have three systems. Uh, you have buffer systems, which we'll talk about shortly. Uh, you have respiratory excretion of carbon dioxide. And you also have renal excretion of hydrogen ions. And let's talk about the acid buffer systems first. Uh, the first one is near and dear to our hearts. It is the bicarbonate buffer system. Uh, bicarbonate ion, I remember bicarbonate acid is a, is a pretty, uh, pretty weak uh, acid bases. But because of that, they're able to convert stronger acids into weaker acids. So bicarbonate ion will convert strong acid into a weak acid, or bicarbonate ion, whereas carbonic acid will be able to convert a strong base into a weak base, uh, thus buffering it. So again, this is the equation we've seen many, many times before. The other two, not so much. Uh, you have the phosphate buffering system, and you have monohydrogen phosphate which is this guy. Uh, this converts a strong acid to a weak acid. And you have dihydrogen phosphate ion, so this is a weak acid. And this can convert a strong base to a weak base. Whereas the monohydrogen phosphate, this is the alkaline component. Uh, you have a protein buffering system. Uh, remember, proteins are made up of amino acids, so you have an amine group and an acid group. Uh, and from the amine group, you can get NH3, and it can release a hydrogen ion in the presence of excess base, bases. And you have the COO group, which can accept hydrogen ions in the, need, in the presence of uh, excess acid. And this chart kind of uh, gives you an overview of what we just talked about. That's a very nice chart. Uh, respiratory, uh, how do we regulate uh, carbon dioxide by breathing? Um, if we increase, well, actually, remember, carbon dioxide comes from the cells. Carbon dioxide is a waste product of cellular respiration. So if carbon dioxide is produced, uh, it will react with water to produce uh, carbonic acid. Carbonic acid releases hydrogen ions, so it's lowering our blood pH. Uh, this stimulates our respiratory centers. Remember, there are chemoreceptors there. This increases the rate and depth of breathing, so we eliminate more uh, carbon dioxide through the lungs. Um, the renal method of secreting hydrogen ions. If you take a high in, a good amount of proteins, uh, and metabolize those, you start to increase the amounts of sulfuric and phosphoric acid. Um, and this increases the hydrogen ion concentration in body fluids, lowering the pH. So you start secreting more hydrogen ions in the re uh, renal tubules. So you urinate more hydrogen ions out, so your urine becomes more acidic. And your body fluids, in turn, uh, return to their normal pH. Um, now, um, when our body is regulating pH, the first line of defense is the chemical buffering system, and the most abundant or the most utilized uh, chemical buffering system is the bicarbonate buffering system, and followed by the phosphate and the protein buffering system. But in general, the first line of defense is the uh, chemical buffering system. The second line of defense is the physiological buffers. Uh, the respiratory and the renal. Um, okay, let me in show here to uh, believe I missed a slide talking about 
or did I take that slide out? Oh, I must have accidentally taken that slide out. Talking about the pH range of uh, your blood. Your pH range in your blood is between 7.35 and 7.45. Let me see if I can find that slide in another presentation. Uh, bear with me. Um, and the reason why I wanted to show you this slide uh, was to remind you or to kind of emphasize how important it was to balance your acids and bases. Let's see. I guess I got a little carry away in my editing. Here we go, acids and base imbalance. Okay, I guess I did get carried away. Um, again, the reason why you need three systems to regulate um, acid bases is because there's a very narrow window uh, for pH 0.1, so between 7.35 and 7.45 is normal pH range. That's not a lot of variation. Um, acidosis begins, okay, should uh, your pH uh, begin to drop below uh, 7.35. And uh, so once your pH drops, and if it gets below 6.8, then uh, this can lead to death. On the other hand, alkalosis, uh, you begin early stage alkalosis when your pH starts to rise above 7.45. And um, if it goes above 8, then you are leaving a uh, survival range. So um, acidosis can result, again, from an increased accumulation of acids or loss of bases. Either one will cause an increase of hydrogen ions and thus drop the pH. Alkalosis can either result from a loss of uh, uh, acids or, in, or it can be accumulation of bases. And that can bring a, a decrease in hydrogen ion concentrations, uh, and that leads to the rise in your pH. So some of the ways you can uh, acquire acidosis, uh, you can get decreased rates in depth of breathing, so you can start hypoventilating. Uh, Perhaps you get obstruction of air passages, uh, decreased gas exchange, um, and that can lead to accumulation of, C2, of CO2. And of course, CO2 plus water is converted to an acid, and that leads to respiratory acidosis. Um, also, kidney failure. And uh, so kidney failure to excrete acids, so it's inability to excrete hydrogen ions. And your body may be making excessive hydrogen ions or excessive ketones, such as if you uh, suffer from a condition such as diabetes mellitus. Again, you start to accumulate non-respiratory acids, and that leads to uh, metabolic acidosis. Um, excessive loss of bases can be caused by either prolonged diarrhea or prolonged vomiting. Um, alkalosis can result from, um, again, uh, hyperventilation, anxiety, fever, uh, poisoning, high altitude. You lose a lot of carbon dioxide. Uh, losing a lot of carbon dioxide causes a decrease in hydrogen ions. So you start to get more bicarbonate ion, and that leads to respiratory alkalosis. Uh, gastric drainage, uh, 
Vomiting with excess uh, gastric secretions can lead to a loss of acids, and that can lead to an increase in alkaline substances, and that is another cause of metabolic acidosis or alkalosis. And that is the end of my presentation. Uh, thanks very much.